Hello and welcome to TV on TV. I'm State Representative Tommy Vitolo. You're watching Brookline Interactive Group, and we've got a great show today. Uh, I want to let you know, as soon as I'm done with the news, we're going to go right to an interview with Brookline Public Schools Principal of Remote Learning, Meg Messini, and Coordinator of School Health Services, Trisha Laham. And we're going to talk about what it means for the schools to be reopening and what that's going to look like. Uh, but first, we want to run through a little bit of news. Uh, some great news for folks who are unemployed and collecting unemployment. It's been a, a real challenge, uh, but we've got some great news. Uh, folks who are on unemployment will be get, receiving an extra $300 per week, retroactive to August 1st. And that's through a FEMA program. That funding will continue until the 1st of late December. The money runs out or... Uh, legislation is enacted at the federal level to replace that with a different source of funding. I wouldn't hold my breath on the third one. Uh, hopefully it'll stretch all the way through the end of December, but we frankly don't know. Nevertheless, uh, great news. I uh, want to let you know that tomorrow is 9-11, the 19th anniversary, and at 9.30 a.m. Brookline Interactive Group, what you're watching now will begin live coverage of Brookline's 9-11 Remembrance. So again, that's 9.30 tomorrow morning. You can watch it on cable. You can watch it online in the live stream. As I mentioned, the first day of school is coming. It is Wednesday, September 16th. Uh, and I, as a school parent, mixed feelings, right? Uh, really excited. My daughter is going to be uh, enrolling in kindergarten, and she will be in person at Pierce. My son, fourth grade, will be... Um, fully virtual at first and will hopefully soon transition to in-person learning. Uh, it's a lot of work for parents when the kids are home learning, but we've got to get them back to school um, and we've got to get them learning again. And so I'm excited that they will be doing that. I don't want to uh, stretch this out. I want to get right to our interview. Um, and so without further ado, let's cut right on over and talk with Meg Messini. Uh, principal of Remote Learning Academy, and with registered nurse Trisha Laham, uh, coordinator of School Health Services. You're watching Big. Thanks so much. And as promised today, we've got not one, but two great folks we're going to be talking with. Uh, first, we're going to talk with Trisha Laham. She's a registered nurse, but importantly, She's the coordinator of School Health Services, and we're going to talk through uh, exactly what it means to be on campus this fall and how uh, the school system and everyone in it are going to help keep each other safe uh, and healthy. And after that, in, in just a few minutes, we're going to get to uh, the principal of the Remote Learning Academy, uh, Meg, I'm going to get this right, Messini, uh, and Meg Messini and I, we're going to talk about distance learning. So. Uh, both of you, welcome. Uh, Tricia, if it's okay, we're going to start with you. And, um, you know, the big, the big first question, I think, is uh, can you share some of the procedures um, the school is using, the nurses are using, maybe in the classroom as well, uh, that'll be out there to help keep our kids who are in the building, as well as our faculty and staff who are in the building, how are we going to keep them safe? Well, I think it's important to know that we are starting with the pillars of uh, public health and our mitigation strategies, which are everyone will be wearing a mask. We will have social distancing, which is six feet uh, apart from each other. We will have frequent hand washing. Um, what are the other pillars? I have uh, got a blank there. Um, hand washing, social distance, our masks. And I know there's um, water bottles because water fountains won't be available, right? They're thinking about using the restrooms. So there's, there's quite a bit. But actually, if it's okay, let's focus on the masks. Um, you know, in general, in public, we see lots of different masks. We see surgical masks, we see cloth masks, we see these sort of balaclavas and other things. We've seen the masks with that little gadget, that little um, vent 
Um, and we unfortunately see quite a few masks kind of hanging out around the chin or around the neck. Um, what sort of masks are um, in the protocol for Brookline Public Schools and which ones are not? And what are the expectations around um, students and adults wearing those masks on campus? Uh, the expectation is that everyone will be wearing a mask unless there is a medical or behavioral contraindication to wearing a mask. So everybody will wear a mask. We are saving N95 masks just for healthcare providers. So the nurses will have a, a small supply of N95s. Um, others will be wearing, uh, it might not be a surgical mask, but it's similar to a surgical mask or other cloth masks that people will be bringing in from home. Parents and staff will supply their own masks and we will have a backup supply if a mask gets soiled um, or forgotten or lost. Um, the masks with the valves we are not allowing because particles can come through the mask and defeat the purpose of wearing the mask. So that is prohibited in our schools. Um, the gaiters and some of those bandanas, other types of masks like that, we are discouraging. We haven't prohibited them. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that the droplets can come down. It's not the best, um, particularly with a bandana. It's not as good a protection. And those type of masks beg people to be manipulating them. So you're touching a dirty mask and then you're touching a surface. So it's not our best uh, line of defense to use that type of mask. And um, when a kid forgets a mask or, uh, you know, gets lost somehow because kids can lose anything, um, they're just sent home for the day, right? Come back tomorrow? Sure, a kid forgets a mask, we have a backup mask for them. Uh, we have backup masks for, for staff as well. If a mask gets soiled, we have backup masks. If a student is having a hard time wearing a mask, we will work with that student. Uh, we expect that there'll be a fair amount of education that's required to help students wear a mask. It's one thing to be wearing them a little bit over the summer. It's probably a little bit different to be wearing it several hours during the school day. So we are going to have to provide education for students, have some patience with the expectation that it is a strict expectation. And finally, um, you know, kids get sick all the time in lots of different ways. And sometimes it's a minor symptom and sometimes it's something significant. And sometimes kids just cough and sneeze and they're not sick. And so how is this, are the teachers and the students and the nurses and others going to navigate when a kid demonstrates a small or a significant symptom of anything, what happens then? How do we make sure we're not overreacting but also not underreacting? Well, if we're going to err, we will err on the side of overreacting. We will follow all the DESE and CDC guidelines. So we're gonna start really with asking parents and staff to be our partners in this. Our success is completely dependent on everyone taking seriously the idea that you stay home when you're sick. That was one of those other fundamentals that I couldn't think of a few minutes ago. Staying home when you're sick is a key thing. So we are asking parents and staff to sign an attestation form that you will check for a fever or any symptoms before you head out each day. You'll have to sign it only once, but we ask you to do the review every day to be sure that if you have symptoms, you're staying home. You know, in the past, uh, parents might have sent kids to school who weren't at their best, and this is a different year. Those same rules cannot apply, so we need full partnership with that. So that's our basis. Then you come to school if you have symptoms, the teacher will call the nurse, the nurse will do an assessment. We have a medical waiting room at school if it's a student that we think fits uh, COVID symptom criteria and the student will wait there till we um, reach out to the parent. We want parents to come quickly to get their student and then we will follow lots of uh, 
pretty detailed criteria for what the next steps are. And the good news is if your student um, is sent home for a half a day or a day and a half or two and a half days, um, there'll be support for them. And we're going to get to that um, with Principal Messini in a minute. But I've got one more question for you, Tricia, and that is um, tell us about flu shots. The state is now requiring flu shots, um, but maybe you could give us a little more information about who's required um, and why that's so important. Well, it's new this year. It's always been recommended. It is newly required this year that all students uh, in public schools will have the flu shot uh, by December 31st. So there's time to get it. Brookline will, uh, the public health department is offering three flu clinics, which will uh, be an additional place for families to get flu shot if they're not getting it from their health care provider. And it's really important because we know that COVID-19 mimics the flu, it mimics most other things. So if people get a flu shot, we have fewer people having the flu and less confusion about what you might be sick with. It'll be much to our advantage in keeping more people in school longer. Trisha, thank you for joining me today and giving us some, uh, some information and I think some reassurance about what public school in person is going to be like from a health perspective. I'm sure it's always uh, evolving and new work is being done, but thank you so much for all of your efforts. And now, uh, if it's all right, we're gonna pivot uh, to Principal Messini who is the principal of the Remote Learning Academy. Uh, Meg, thank you for joining us, and uh, we're delighted you're here. Can you tell us, um, tell us about this Remote Learning Academy? Who can come? Uh, who is it for? How's it, how's it, who's, who's showing up every day? So thanks, Tommy, for having us on. Uh, the Remote Learning Academy is our fully remote option for parents and students who have opted to stay home for an extended period of time during the school year. And it's for this particular uh, remote learning academy is for K to eight students. So um, parents were asked about a month ago by the district in a survey to indicate what their choice might be. And we've, we're still getting um, family input. So if families want to be in the remote learning academy, they can still email us and indicate that. And the families who have emailed or have indicated this choice either have a um, the child has a personal medical concern or a family member might have a personal medical concern or the parents are concerned about having the child eventually come back when we're in hybrid model for grades one through one through eight. So um, we've had we've had parents um, join us that way and students join us that way. Um, so that remote learning academy is set up to offer the same kind of high quality K-8 to experience that Brookline parents have come to enjoy and expect at our eight K-8 to schools. So we are going to be providing in a fully remote way, wonderful classes led by PSB teachers from the full array of the eight schools. So we'll be seeing some familiar faces with Remote Learning Academy, and they will be offering the same curriculum that is offered at our K-8 to schools in same learning expectations. We'll have specials, we'll have EL services, special education services, um, intervention services, um, any, you know, basically almost everything that is offered at re regular in-person school, except it will be offered remotely. I do wanna say that this is a, a, a massive and unprecedented time for us in, um, in the Office of Teaching and Learning. Uh, never mind in Brookline. Um, and this is our first fully remote learning academy. We're getting it up and running in a month, um, which is, and I have to just say that our teachers and staff members are awesome. They've been preparing hard all summer for this because we're returning basically remote in our grades one through eight. So I want to reassure parents that this is going to be as difficult a decision as it was to make to have your children stay home for the foreseeable future. They will be getting a high quality, responsive, warm and welcoming education in this remote learning academy. Thank you for that. Now, um, for, for the viewers who um, haven't been um, as paying attention as closely to uh, what's going to happen starting next week when, when school starts, uh, beep, 
the early ed, kindergartners, and um, some of the most vulnerable students will be um, welcome to attend in person, uh, but they can choose to do the Remote Learning Academy instead, and students grade two through eight will be, all begin, uh, with the exception of those, those most vulnerable, in the Remote Learning Academy, and then as the school gets cleared more and more classrooms uh, to be uh, adequately safe to comply with the standards, then more and more students will be invited in. And so this will be sort of an ongoing process and families are going to um, need to be flexible. Uh, and that's just sort of the reality. Now, um, Tommy, could I just butt in for just one moment? Just to clarify something. So we have two options. So we have remote plus, and that means that grades one through eight, as we start rolling into hybrid, will be coming in um, in a hybrid model. Remote Academy is, is totally separate. So the remote Academy is fully remote and students will stay remote as long as their parents wish them to. So they're actually, it's, it's essentially a ninth school that is a combination of all the other eight schools. And I think that's important to mention because um, parents may not want their, their children to come in when we go remote. I mean, when we go hybrid, excuse me. So I just wanted to clarify that. So there's the remote plus option, which is our hybrid model. And then there's the remote learning academy, which is going to be offered on a term to term basis where parents can opt in and opt out as they feel comfortable, but as a fully remote learning academy. Thank you for that clarification. That's, uh, you know, I didn't, I clearly didn't quite get that uh, until now. So thank you. Um, and I actually want to follow up on that. Um, when a student who is attending class, at least sometimes in person, um, gets sick for a day or two, right? Doesn't have to be COVID, just has the sniffles, isn't coming in. Um, will the fact that Brooklyn is doing remote learning um, result in that student having access to um, remote support uh, for the day or two or three that she is sick? Or is it going to be like it was pre-COVID where, you know, you're home, lay on the couch, watch The Price is Right, have some snacks, and we'll see you in a couple of days. Oh, those good old days, or let's make a deal. I'm really aging myself here. But um, what I would say is that we're planning for those eventualities. So if a student is staying in their home school, then uh, obviously with hybrid, they're still going to be remote part of the time and in school part of the time. My understanding is that our schools are planning for those eventualities. And as if a student is out for any extended period of time as a public school district, we have to provide access to their public education. So I think for students that are out for an extended period of time, those arrangements will be made through guidance counselors, through child support teams and with teachers and with parents, obviously. So, um, but for a day or two, I think that, you know, one of the things that, that this whole pandemic has shown us is we have to be so transparent and such excellent communicators about what's going on in class so that our teachers will be communicating when a kid misses a day. This is what the learning plan is for the week. So if, if a child has to miss for a day, the parent will hopefully know this is how to access whatever learning that is. So and for the foreseeable future, we are remote totally, except for, as you said, beep, K, and most vulnerable. Thank you. Now, you know, this, this next question is a bit of a tough one, um, but it, it is our reality, right? So when, when the schools were closed, we had students, we had parents, we had teachers who had no expectation of instantly switching to remote learning and were forced to do so with no training, no preparation, um, no experience with technology, no lesson plans, right? This was really hard. And I, I want to fully acknowledge that. But I also want to fully acknowledge that the product that the students received was not especially good, right? And there's, like I said, there's a lot of good reasons for that. But I think we need to acknowledge that between March and June, our students got nowhere near the quality of education they would have gotten had COVID not happened. And so my question is, for the parents who... Um, watch that firsthand because unlike normal times, they were also at home, right? Trying to work their full-time job from home and, you know, drag their kids along for their education at the same time. Tell us how that experience is going to be so much better 
starting next week because I, I promise you many parents, I won't speak for all, but many parents um, were really pulling their hair out and care so much about the teachers, but frankly care most about their own kids and want their kids to have a quality education. So tell me how great that's gonna be starting next week. Well, I can tell you that um, obviously the whole nation was caught off guard with what happened last spring. Nobody felt good in education about what was delivered because we just had never been faced with this kind of catastrophe. And so in speaking with teachers and coordinators and our educators in the system, ever since the pandemic hit, the Office of Teaching and Learning has been working in partnership with the Brookline Education Foundation, the Innovation Fund, and all of our schools to make professional development first available to our teachers. Our, our um, director of technology and library, Scott Moore, has been leading the charge with preparing teachers on Google Classroom, Seesaw, and Canvas, and other remote platforms that we'll be using to access learning. Our teachers over the summer have been preparing so hard with coordinators, both in terms of subject matter, content, and pedagogical skills that are specialized for remote engagement with kids because we recognize Remote engagement is so different than in-person engagement. We need a certain skill set. So I think that what's going to be drastically better is preparation. I think what's going to be drastically better is communication. I think that we have seen over the summer, we have a superintendent that has been very clear on a weekly basis, updating parents about what's been going on because our district is in the midst of a lot of change on top of having to deal with a pandemic. So I think that, you know, this is a way that um, I think those two things are immediately better. And I think also the, the recognition, and I also wanna say that this has given us the opportunity as a community to pull together. We have advisory panels that were convened by the school committee with volunteers from Brookline and parents and other concerned community members who have developed a lot of wonderful ideas and material professional development communications to make this school year much more easy for families, uh, which in these things will be rolled out. So I think that that alone, this has really brought us together in ways that we have not been brought together in the past and having to examine some tough realities about where we are as a society and where we are as a school system. So I think that, um, that those things are going to be markedly better. We're prepared um, as well as we can be we're communicating what we know with parents as we know it, and we are coming together as a community to work together to try to support one another in the face of, of circumstances where we don't have a lot of control over some things. We do have control over some things, but not control over others. Thank you. I think that's, that's really helpful. Uh, what, uh, what can the parents and, and others in the family do um, to be prepared for next week, right? So uh, we, 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 we already lost 10 days of learning time in this academic year. We've gone from 180 to 170 to help make sure that we could reopen in a way that made sense. What can, what can be done on the household side to make sure that our kids are just getting the most they can out of their experience, whether it is in the remote learning academy or uh, in a hybrid model? So I really appreciate that question because partners and caregivers are our biggest supporters and our biggest partners in educating children. And so um, I think number one is um, we, our schools are sending out communications about curriculum and about learning expectations and about what's going to happen over the course of, a, of each week. Parents should take a look at that to inform themselves. And if they have questions, they should reach out to their child's teacher. So as much as possible to be prepared to um, take advantage of the resources that we're offering, learning hubs, um, the, the uh, website, take advantage of those things. The other thing I'd like to offer is a lot of kids don't have a space in their home that's set up like a school, just like you know, and I know many parents have sort of asked the question, how can I get my kid to think more about home as school because this is where they're being educated right now. Set up a spot that is quiet to the extent it can be quiet and organized. 
help your child stay organized. Have the materials available for them and, um, and, and have them prepared um, so that the ch child can um, take advantage of that and, and be organized. And the third thing, and I've really thought hard about this, is health and wellness is so important during this time. And in school, we normally have breaks where we schedule a brain break or a movement break. Um, to, I know our teachers will be communicating these breaks and that will come with off sometimes offline time where we're gonna take a 15 minute break, let's get away from the screen. I would really encourage parents to have, um, to take advantage of whatever activities that teachers send home to have a brain break. We know from research that movement has a great impact on learning. Tumbling, Eric Jensen had years ago, tumbling helps with reading. It just, it, it energizes our bodies in different ways. So to the extent we work with our health and wellness teachers, our physical education teachers, and our wonderful classroom teachers and everyone else, take advantage of those brain breaks. Um, working six hours in front of a, 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 a computer is exhausting for anybody. Meg, thank you so much. And Trisha, I want to thank you as well. We're just about out of time. Um, we're just about out of summer. We got a week left, so let's enjoy it. And uh, make sure you've got November 3rd on your calendar. That's a Tuesday. That's election day. It's a big one. You got to make sure you're voting in person or early. Uh, thanks so much for watching Brookline Interactive Group, and we'll see you next time.